Have you ever wondered what lies beneath the surface of social media? What kind of strange and interesting things you could find if you were to just dig a little deeper? Well, in today's video, we'll be taking a look at exactly that. This is the Social Media Iceberg, full series. Starting off at the top of the image, we have the clear skies. Facebook. Facebook is probably the largest social media platform out there, and is without a doubt one of the most influential. Originally being a website where college students would rate the attractiveness of their fellow students. This platform was created by Mark Zuckerberg, and at the time was already collecting a lot of personal data from people. Facebook was created in 2004 and became a smash hit. Originally it was very popular with the youth, but has now seen itself being a major misinformation hub that's mostly inhabited by old people. And your parents and stuff. Facebook and its products will definitely appear more on this iceberg. Rise of social media. Social media as a whole has seen such a quick and insanely successful rise to power, both on the internet and in our society as a whole. The concept of this online ecosystem that only around 15 years ago was nothing and is now an insanely powerful multimedia network that spans through the entire world is its wild. And we didn't even see it coming. Metaverse. The Metaverse is Facebook's new project to make a VR world that is a lot more than a game. Hell, Facebook even changed its entire company name to Meta. They're essentially trying to make the Oasis from Ready Player One. The Metaverse is something of infamy. Some people think it's great, while others are very scared of it. The Metaverse name itself comes from a 1992 novel by the name of Snow Crash. This video is being rewritten in December of 2021, and the Metaverse isn't much right now, but it's gonna get big. Cancel culture. Cancel culture is a bit hard to explain, but it's essentially a thing that people partake in online which they try and bring accountability to people who have done something wrong. Or, at least in their eyes, done something wrong. Sometimes people get cancelled for super valid reasons, making cancel culture a good force, while others get cancelled for something that they didn't even do or just things that weren't worth it. Cancel culture has become a total boogeyman for people on the right wing, and I honestly think that's pretty funny. It's not really a great thing, but it's really not as bad as a lot of people say. Dark Mode. This entry is pretty self-explanatory. Dark Mode is a preference that you can set on a lot of websites to change the traditional white background to a nice dark grey, which makes it a lot more comfortable to look at at night. Death of Vine. Vine was a social media platform created by the same people who made Twitter. It was a really simple social media, one where every video was only around 6 seconds long. But it made one hell of an impact. So many vines are so iconic and are constantly being quoted by Gen Z kids. Uh, but here's the thing. Despite its success, Vine shut down in 2017 because it wasn't very monetizable. Vine is still very fondly remembered in the hearts of many. Musical Lee's Purchase Musical Lee was an app where you would basically just kind of lip sync to a variety of different songs, and that's pretty much it. It was really popular with kids and teens, mostly finding its market with preteen girls. But most people who weren't in that age range weren't fans of Musical.ly. But you might be wondering, what is Musical.ly? I've never heard of that. Well, in May of 2017, a Chinese media conglomerate purchased Musical.ly. This company is called ByteDance LTD. In August of 2018, Musical.ly was shut down and then merged with something you might be familiar with. TikTok. Creepypasta. Creepypastas are essentially online campfire stories, coming from the term copypasta, which is a combination word of copy and pasting. The reason they're called creepypastas is you can easily copy and paste these stories anywhere you want. Creepypastas were some of the most iconic stories on the internet. They were really something else at the time. So many creepypasta characters and stories are so iconic and are unforgettable parts of the internet. Tip of the iceberg, Among Us sightings. This century is one of a couple joke ones. I'm pretty sure this one's just related to those stupid videos claiming to find real life Among Us characters. Most infamous examples will probably be the ones by Arcade Craniacs. Okay, so it turns out I was actually wrong about this entry. This is not, like, YouTube videos of Among Us. Back a little while ago, Among Us characters were being seen, like, everywhere in shapes that vaguely look like them. So that's why this entry is here. It's just people seeing shapes that look like Among Us characters and feeling like they look like Among Us characters. That's about it. The Rise of Storytime Animators. So, you're probably familiar with the genre of storytime animations. Most famous of these being the odd ones out, and Jaden animations. This genre went from being nothing to something, and something as in one of the biggest and most profitable on all of YouTube. I remember being a kid and finding the odd ones out back when he had under 100,000 subscribers, and I liked it quite a lot. I'm pretty sure he only had like 40,000 subscribers at the time, and I remember really hoping that the genre took off, and well, look at them now. 4chan. 4chan is one of the most infamous and iconic websites on the surface web of the internet. It started off as an anime discussion forum, but eventually became one of the biggest websites for weird neckbeards who've never touched a boob. The website has a lot of negative stigma towards it, and for good reason. But the website's responsible for so much of the internet. 
So many memes come from 4chan. Bronies come from 4chan. There's a lot of terrible stuff that comes from the website, but it's still an incredibly iconic part of the internet to this day. John Doe. John Doe is one of the first accounts ever made in the online game Roblox. It's speculated that John Doe was just made as a test account by Roblox, but there are Roblox conspiracy theories and creepypastas about how this John Doe character is a hacker, or is an evil haunted account that will hack you and steal all of your Robux. Undertale Fandom's Vastness This one's pretty self-explanatory. The fanbase for the game Undertale was expansive. Very, very expansive. At the game's height of popularity, it was almost impossible for anyone to escape it. The fandom was also pretty shitty, so it could get pretty annoying at times. Influencer Scandals Influencers are often pretty shitty people. That, of course, leads to a bunch of scandals and all that, because a lot of the time they're just bad people that end up being becoming famous, and then they have a massive audience they can creep on or whatever it may be. Whether they want to steal money from them, scam them, you know, there's so much stuff. Furry Fandom Conglomerate The furry community is fucking massive. It doesn't matter what you're looking for, it doesn't matter how obscure you think certain things may be, there's most likely furry art of it. And I'm not gonna show you because I straight up don't like it. But the thing is about the furry community is that in a way it's kind of a conglomerate in the sense that they all like the same thing in the end. Slenderman Slenderman is one of the most infamous creepypasta characters of all time. The character is a tall and very slender man with a dapper suit and a white face. This character scared so many children back in the day, and he's incredibly memorable and iconic. There are many videos on social media claiming to be the real Slenderman, or, you know, showing sightings of the real Slenderman, which are a ton of fun to watch, because a lot of the time they're terrible. Shallow Waters. Corporate Twitter accounts. Alright, so on the social media website Twitter, there are a bunch of corporations with Twitter accounts. In the past, these were nothing special, mainly just used to promote new products or events, but in 2017, the Twitter account for Wendy started roasting people in the comments and was generally just really sassy. This became a sensation since people had never seen a corporation act like this online. Other companies joined in on the trend, leading it to become a really cringe thing. Really cringe tweets ended up coming out of this. Nowadays, most corporations actually have Twitter accounts which are trying to be cool. Analog Horror Analog horror is a relatively new horror subgenre which deals with the fear of old technology. That's not really the best way to say it. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's such a creepy, specific thing. Local 58 is a creepy web series that is made to look like it's old footage from an old TV show. Local 58 is actually created by the same man who created Candle Cove, which is one of the best creepypastas out there. Local 58 is a great example of what analog horror really is, but there's also a lot more, and it's becoming a more and more popular thing. Analog horror is an incredibly interesting form of horror, and I highly suggest that you check it out. It hits really hard, for me at least. TikTok Benadryl Challenge This entry is referring to a stupid challenge that got popular on TikTok in 2020. This challenge was literally just to see how much Benadryl you could take until you got high, which is a, you know, a side effect of excessive use of Benadryl. But you know what else is? Death. Yeah, unfortunately this challenge actually killed people, which is so unfortunate. TikTok not removing videos of this challenge led to death which is obviously incredibly irresponsible of the platform. Facebook is bloatware. Alright, so the Facebook app itself, like on your phone, used to take up way too much space on people's phones. This ended up being because there's just a bunch of random stuff that the app doesn't really even use that just makes the file size way too big. This also led to your DMs on Facebook making the storage size even more disproportionate. Really just poorly done. Bronies. Bronies are male fans of the cartoon show My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. My Little Pony captivated people on 4chan of all places at first. The name is a mix of Bro and Pony, created by some random 4chan user. The community grew to unforeseen sizes with full-on conventions all across America, the biggest and most official of which being BronyCon. In recent years this community has kind of died, but many people still have really fond memories from when it was still a big thing. DeviantArt Infamy DeviantArt is a website where users can upload a massive variety of art of basically anything. It started off pretty normal, but quickly became a place inhabited by a lot of different types of people. There were even controversies within the website communities, uh, like a long debate over art bases. I think this entry is mostly referring to the weird-ass fetish art communities that exist on DeviantArt. I mean, Deviant, it's, uh, it's in the name. Flat Earthers. This entry is referring to a fascinating group of people who genuinely believe that the Earth is flat instead of being a normal, you know, round planet shape. This was a belief hundreds of years ago, but has picked up again in recent times. This theory is just bizarre, but there are a lot of people who genuinely believe it. This is labeled as a conspiracy theory, and for this reason, there are conspiracy theories about this theory, claiming that it was planted by the government to make other credible conspiracy theories look bad, since flat earthers are so baseless and dumb. It's basically saying, oh yeah, look at how dumb conspiracy theories are, these other ones are also dumb by, you know, by proxy. 
Belle Delphine bathwater incident. This entry is probably referring to one of two different things regarding Belle Delphine and her bathwater. For those who don't know, Belle Delphine is an internet celebrity who is famous for her looks and the strange things that she does and dresses up as. In 2019, she sold little jars of water that she had bathed in. Since we live in dystopia, all of these sold out immediately, so she continued to just take baths and, and sell the water and make a ton of cash. The controversy comes from people who claim to contract herpes after drinking the bathwater. This wasn't true. It was just a random tweet that someone sent out to get attention. The tweet was made before the bathwater was even shipped, so that wasn't even true, but other internet users who were self-proclaimed microbiologists tested the bathwater for human DNA and found none. Now, is this true? Well again, this is just unconfirmed tweets and 4chan posts, so no, probably not. Bell claims that all the bathwater was indeed legitimate, but people still are skeptical. r slash I'm sorry John I'm sorry John is a subreddit dedicated to making disturbing horror art of Garfield. The designs that people come up with are truly unique and genuinely pretty scary a lot of the time. The fact that they turn the little innocent concept of Garfield into a terrifying satire of its original self is pretty awesome, and it's kind of a testament to how cool and bizarre the World Wide Web can get. Middle of the Ice Reddit Super Bowl During the 2021 Super Bowl, Reddit, for the first time ever, aired a super short little commercial that glitched in and out. The ad itself plays with the fact that the Super Bowl ads are expensive and honestly is kinda cool. I personally don't love Reddit as a whole, but I'll admit this is a pretty unique ad if nothing else. Crawler Sightings Alright, so crawlers are a subset of cryptids. For those who don't know, a cryptid is a name given to animals and creatures who aren't confirmed to exist. See my Cryptid Iceberg video for more information, it's a, it's a good watch, you'll like it. Crawlers are specifically humanoid cryptids that are often hairless and pale. Their movements and limbs are often just a little bit inhuman, or a lot inhuman. Basically those vampires from American Horror Story. There are a lot of videos on social media claiming to show these creatures in action alongside a bunch of first-hand accounts of, of these creatures as well. The Tumblr Exodus. The century is referring to an almost apocalyptic event on the website Tumblr. You see, Tumblr is a website that hosts a lot of fandoms and communities. Like any website, there are a lot of really weird and annoying people on Tumblr, but on this website, their voices are amplified to a point where, you know, being weird and annoying kind of became a stereotype for a Tumblr user. On December 17th, 2018, Tumblr banned not safe for work content. A lot of people were on Tumblr for this type of content, so it almost dismantled the infrastructure of the entire website. So many people left and migrated to other websites, mostly Twitter. This made Twitter a website with a community that had been worsened by all the worst people of Tumblr calling it their new home. This event is known as the Tumblr Exodus. Ghost Gum has got a really great video on it if you want to learn more. A Roblox Black Market Didn't think I'd be saying that anytime soon. Uh, this entry is referring to a bizarre underground system of people who trade real-life money in exchange for Roblox items. This is not allowed, it could get your account banned, but for whatever reason, it is and was very much a thing. Cicada 3301 Cicada 3301 was an ARG that was one of the most advanced of its time. The game used methods of puzzle solving that were never really seen before, and it's only a very small amount of people who actually completed it. I'm not going to go into detail about this since we would be here all day, but it's a pretty interesting theory that Cicada 3301 was actually a recruitment system by the US government so they could find the best spies and codebreakers. Honestly, I kind of love that concept and I hope that it's true. r slash Pikmin Insanity. This entry is referring to the bizarre state of the Pikmin subreddit. After a lack of content, the sub went feral with crazy nonsensical posts being all that you could find in a once genuine Pikmin fan subreddit. The Sun Vanished The Sun Vanished was a pretty fascinating ARG that unfolded on Twitter. The concept was simple. Somehow the sun just randomly vanished, and then of course, slowly the world goes to shit. The tweeter has to adapt and survive. The whole thing started four years ago, but the account will still return periodically and tweet just a bit more to update people. Diary of a Wimpy Kid Fanfiction Alright, so this is a pretty bizarre one, but of course it's a thing. On the internet, there's a concerning amount of Diary of a Wimpy Kid fanfiction. Some are clearly comedic, while others are genuine. Some actually just look like the original books, which is pretty interesting. There is a very iconic one about Greg and Rowley growing up, and uh, Gre Greg being gay and into Rowley, and there's like a, a very popular uh, part of that comic where he says, I'm not gay, Greg, and I think that's probably the most popular example. The Steven Universe Fandom Harassment Alright, so there are some people in the fandom for a cartoon show by the name of Steven Universe that are very toxic and just crazy. These types of people in the fandom would attack and harass people for the smallest things. I think the most infamous example of this is a time an artist drew a heavyset character from the show, Thin. The artist got harassed and got death threats from a shit ton of people, which is genuinely just despicable. The Body 
The carnivore's fandom refuses to die. This one took me a second to figure out, but this entry is actually referring to an old dinosaur video game with a very dedicated fan base who still makes mods for it to this day. That's about it. 8kun. 8kun, previously called 8chan, Infinite Chan, or Infinity Chan, is an image board website composed of user created message boards. 8kun is basically the worst of 4chan in a sense. Like, this website gets really, really bad. I'm not gonna get into detail, but there's a lot of fucked up stuff on that website, since there's little to no moderation. Roblox cults. So believe it or not, there are cults on Roblox. The cult family is one of the most well-known groups of myths on Roblox, tracing its origin back to 2012. They are heavy religious influence, being members of an unknown branch of Christianity. It's bizarre, but hey, that's just how it is. There's a lot of weird stuff on Roblox that can be found with a bit of digging, and it's kind of amazing. Zalgo. The Zalgo text generator is how you get your normal text to look crazy, and uh, creepy like this. Even if you didn't know it by name, you've probably seen Zalgo text somewhere, so that's why it's here. Camera Heads. Camera Heads is one of the most fascinating parts of this entire iceberg in my opinion. There was once a 4chan thread describing a creepypasta style story about a guy finding a note saying, I killed a camera head, signs of a struggle, and a smashed camera alongside a VHS tape. The story then went into the guy being hunted and stalked by these camera head creatures. There's a video on YouTube uploaded by the name of Camera Head. The video is mostly just static, with, uh, with some faint images. Towards the end, a figure with a smiling mask-like face emerges from the static, and quickly recedes. Lots of 4chan users remember the story, which makes its seemingly random disappearance pretty strange and honestly unfortunate. It's such an interesting and gripping concept, and I really hope that someday we find an archive of the original story to finally put the mystery to rest. Teletubbies Facts Twitter Account on Twitter, there's an account by the name of Teletubbies Facts that looks innocent at first, but definitely isn't. It's an alternate reality game, which features a man named Dave, the owner of the account, getting mad and violent towards his ex-wife. He picked up some speed in 2017, but fell off after that. Rainbot Horror made a video on it that popularized it, but the story continued after that. Evolved Ape NFT Scandal NFTs I'm not a fan. If you don't know what an NFT is, then, well, good for you. I envy you. There's a line of NFTs being released by the name of Evolved Apes. This line of digital art was manned by a guy who went by Evil Ape. He promised an epic fighting game with these ugly ass characters and assured people that this line of NFTs was going to be the next big thing. But guess what? It was a total scam. Evil Ape took around $3 million and ran. Nothing he promised came true and he completely just deleted everything like it's a Twitter account. NFTs are a really risky game, not only for the future of our planet, but also just the people who invest in them. Unfavorable Semicircle Unfavorable Semicircle is the name of a series of channels on YouTube which garnered attention for the high volume and unusual nature of the published videos. The BBC has referred to Unfavorable Semicircle as YouTube's strangest mystery. Unfavorable Semicircle has also been referred to as one of the top 10 weirdest YouTube channels. In March of 2015, a YouTube account with the title Unfavorable Semicircle was created. The channel began uploading large numbers of videos on April 5th. The channel continued to post large numbers of videos, all titled with the Sagittarius symbol or a random six-digit number or both, but most lacking the description. The videos often just display abstract pixelated images, but in some cases they show uh, just a single thought in a field of solid brown, or some videos emit a sound while others feature just distorted sounds. Some videos are only seconds in length, while others are much longer. One completely silent video was 11 hours in length. Unfavorable Semicircle was in the mainstream back in 2016, but has mostly been forgotten since. As far as I know, no one has fully solved this yet, if there is a mystery at all. And I don't know if anyone ever will. And now, we got a quick word from our sponsor, Manscaped. Ugh, damn it! That's bullshit. Hit me. Ugh, really? What? Never mind. You have summoned the genie in the box. Uh, what are you? What do you think, genius? Genie in a bottle. So you're the smart one. Okay, uh, so what now? We get one wish. Wait, just one? Not you, him. One wish. Come on, I don't got all day. What I really want is a girlfriend. Seriously? You could have wished for anything, and that's fine. What a dick. You mind if I... Uh.
Hey, man. Hey. I love how your hair looks. Thank you, thank you. I like yours. Told you to use the smart one. Whatever, man. Manscaped. Use code Raymundo for 20% off your order and free shipping. Bottom of the ice. An intruder image dating back to 2010. Alright, so this refers to a police sketch of a large-eyed man wearing a black hood. The image achieved prominence online several times, first shared on 4chan's TJ board in 2010. But you probably recognize it from its popularity in 2021 after it became mainstream in meme culture thanks to its use in the Mandela Catalog video series. To me, the image is kind of funny, but many people are genuinely really scared of it, and they're very unnerved by it. I feel like the fact that it's a police sketch kind of increases its fear factor. I'm curious as to know how this image makes you guys feel. Is it terrifying? Is it funny? Or somewhere in between? Let me know in the comments. A858 Alright, so this entry is referring to a very bizarre subreddit that posted exclusively very, very hard to crack puzzles, essentially. The actual subreddit was private and only a select few amount of people could actually view it. Eventually, a subreddit dedicated to solving it was created, which led to the original becoming open to the public. The subreddit was filled with seemingly random sets of letters and numbers that didn't make any sense until they were solved. Eventually, the actual creator of the subreddit didn't ask me anything on the server dedicated to solving the mystery. The reason they did this AMA was because the audience was getting frustrated. They claimed that they could not disclose the meaning of it and that it would only be disclosed when it ends or when it's discovered. This really, really fascinated users of the internet, so they continued to work on solving the mystery. Five whole years had passed, and multiple news sources had reported on it. In 2015, they ended the entire thing and the original account was deleted. Allegedly, the person doing it all was being paid by a company and the reason that they stopped was because their pay was cut. r slash 858 is still pretty much a mystery and pretty fascinating in my opinion. RuneScape Venezuela Conflict This century is pretty bizarre. Alright, so Venezuela is a country that has an insane amount of inflation, with the minimum wage being only around the equivalent of six dollars. Now for this reason, living there and being able to actually make money is very hard. Interestingly enough, a lot of people in Venezuela have actually turned to the old online game RuneScape to actually make some good money. In the game, you can mine gold. You can sell said gold for American money in cryptocurrency. This has helped so many Venezuelan people and honestly, it's pretty amazing. Some people have made enough money to leave the country and find a better life, which I find really heartwarming. I never played RuneScape as a kid, but I do remember back when it was super popular, so seeing this is really surprising and very hopeful. Red Mist Lost Original Version This entry is pretty interesting here. So I'm sure you're all at least relatively familiar with Red Mist, a creepypasta about Squidward ending his existence on Bikini Bottom. The story's a lost episode of Creepypasta, one of the most popular and iconic ones of all time. In this story, Squidward puts on a live show playing his clarinet, the audience hates it, and their eyes become bloody and hyper-realistic. Yeah, it didn't take much to scare people back in the early 2010s, but Squidward then does what I said earlier, and a shot of his red splattered body is shown. The story has a video to go along with it that claims to be the original Lost episode, however, there are whispers on the internet that there used to be a scarier version of this video that more accurately portrays the story. This video is allegedly lost to media, so if you know about it or where to find it, let me know. To be clear, this isn't the one that you can find on YouTube or Dailymotion or anything. This whole situation is really interesting to me, and it reminds me of the original childhood trauma iceberg in a way. I don't really know, it's just cool. There's a video of someone showing their younger cousins a Red Mist episode that they had edited themselves, so that's not actually it. But it's an alternate cut of the ones that we see usually. Just so you guys know, that's not what we're looking for. Madness Combat Fandom Drama this entry is likely referring to the very toxic parts of the community for the Newgrounds game and web series, Madness Combat, which has become very popular again in recent time. There's some weird amounts of toxicity within this community, where the fans of the game spread out in different Discord servers and they all kind of hate each other for some reason, like they have different communities, like sub-communities within the fandom. The game has a lot of new, younger fans thanks to its inclusion, mods of Friday Night Funkin', so this has brought a bunch of kids into the community, which only serves to make things more annoying and toxic. Something awful. Believe it or not, the majority of online internet culture is rooted in one old obscure website. Not 4chan, not MySpace, and not YouTube, but something awful. The website was created in 1999, was at first more of just a blog, and quickly became much more. Eventually, it became a host to a lot of things that ended up becoming legendary. One notable thing that happened was a fight between a user of the website and the film director Yue Bol, who you might know from his terrible video game movie adaptations. 
Something very, very iconic that came from this website was a certain character that was mentioned earlier in this iceberg. That's right, Slenderman. The original Slenderman image actually comes from this website. The website essentially became a forum that its members paid a small price to be a part of. It hosted events such as Photoshop Friday, which was a weekly event where users would make funny photoshopped images. There was also a ton of classic memes that come from this website, and the website has died off in recent times, so you can still visit it to this day. It's pretty interesting to see this website nowadays since it's really a time capsule of sorts. Crabzilla Hoax Alright, I, I like this one. So back in 2014, this image coming from Bing Maps surfaced on the internet. This aerial view shows a massive crab by this bay. This would be the largest crab known to man, hence the name Crabzilla. Another picture was then posted of Crabzilla poking his head out while two little kids sit by the bay. The size of Crabzilla in this image is actually completely inaccurate to the original one, so what gives? Well, sorry to say, but it's fake. Turns out both pictures are photoshopped and there are no crabs that big. As far as we know. Face Punch Face Punch is an independent video game studio that's been making games for over 17 and a half years. They're responsible for games like Chippy, Rust, and even Gary's Mod. Now that I tell you those games, I assume you're familiar with at least one of their games. Obviously, these games are very popular on social media, so that's why this is here. The Tales of Super John. Hey there, and welcome to episode one of Tales of Super John, with me, your host, Super John. Alright, so The Tales of Super John was a series on YouTube made by a charismatic teenage boy who you might recognize. Yeah, that's JonTron. In this series of Super John, he talks about a variety of different things in a very entertaining and endearing way. These videos seem to have just been recorded on a webcam, so the quality is pretty terrible, which adds to the charm. The channel these videos were uploaded on was called The Onion King, but all the videos have been taken down by John since, but two have been recovered. Seeing a young JonTron making these types of videos before his YouTube fame is really endearing, especially for myself, since he used to be my favorite YouTuber before, well, you know. Let Me Explain Studios was almost murdered. Let Me Explain Studios is a storytime animation YouTuber who's been making videos for a little while now. She made a video explaining how she had a crazy teacher when she was a teen who was incredibly mean and unfair to her and her fellow peers. This eventually led him to having a breakdown in front of her while one of her friends watched. She later learned that while working at another school years later, that teacher killed someone. She believes that if no one else was watching when he was breaking down on her, he may have killed her too. Atmospheric Jellyfish Sightings Atmosphere jellyfish are a type of cryptid that is a floating jellyfish-like creature that people see in the sky. Some think that a lot of UFO sightings are actually sightings of these jellyfish creatures. But what actually are these things? Well, some rational explanations could be that these are either missile tests or satellites. Some people really believe that there could be floating jellyfish creatures up in our upper atmosphere, so that's why it's here. Ong's Hat Ong's Hat is one of the earliest internet-based secret history conspiracy theories. Ong's Hat may be the first alternate reality game ever. If not the first, then definitely one of the first. In Burlington County, New Jersey, there's an area referred to as Ong's Hat. The reason this area is called Ong's Hat is unknown, but people have theories. Some think that there was an old man named Ong, whose lover smashed up and tore up his favorite hat and left it in disrepair in a tree. The hat hanging off the tree could be why this area is known as Ong's Hat. Some think that it's a misspelling of Ong's Hut, but we don't really know. As it stands, Ong's Hat is a pretty desolate area of land, especially being in a forest with nothing too interesting. However, a man by the name of Joseph Matheny claimed to have found papers dating back hundreds of years. One of the texts he found chronicles a group by the name of the Marsh Orthodox Church of America. One of the church's owners was a man by the name of Wally Fort. He supposedly owned land in Ong's Hat. He allegedly started something by the name of the Institute of Chaos Studies, which had a laboratory constructed in the forest where Ong's hat is. These studies constructed in this laboratory were often using psychedelics and quantum physics. Crazy stuff here. There's a theory by the name of Cognitive Chaos. This theory claims that once someone is able to unlock the full capabilities of their brain, they can travel between universes, manipulate physical matter, and heal their body. Apparently, this study led to the creation of a machine in this laboratory. The machine was called the Egg, and allegedly enabled the user to travel between dimensions. Apparently, this machine worked, but was shut down by the Shadow Government. It's obvious that this story is fictional and was created by Joseph Matheny. He later wrote a book about this story, and he made an audiobook alongside it. This is kind of one of the first ARGs in a sense, since it spread throughout early internet. Chris Chan History Oh god. Here we go! 
On February 24, 1982, a boy by the name of Christopher Weston Chandler was born. Christopher was an autistic child who had a very hard early childhood after being abused by a babysitter. Christopher didn't speak until he was seven years old since that event was so traumatic to him. In 1989, Chris and his father Robert Chandler were at a local mall and saw an animatronic band of animal characters that would play music and interact with guests during the holidays. Chris was enamored by these characters to a point where it was a lot more than just a cool show. This band was special to Chris. The main character, Leonard Bernstein, was controlled by a person in another room so it could interact with guests and talk to them. The bear asked Christopher his name, and Chris answered. The bear misheard him and called him Christian. Christopher and his father, Robert Chandler, took this as a sign from God to legally have his name changed to Christian, which they did. Christian had a lot of trouble in school. There wasn't a lot of information about autism and ways to help children with it, alongside Chris's parents being reluctant to send him to a school for mentally challenged children, ended in a lot of stress and hardships for Chris. He had a lot of trouble making friends, and his one lady friend was paid by Chris's father to spend time with him. In 1992, Sega hosted a sweepstakes where viewers of the Sonic the Hedgehog TV show could enter the sweepstakes. Essentially, what you had to do was watch the cartoon and write everything down that Sonic said at the end of it. Many people signed up for it, but Christian was the lucky winner of it all. This marked a turning point in Chris's life. Chris felt important and lucky, one of a kind. It also sparked an unending devotion to Sonic the Hedgehog. His parents saw this as a really good example as to how good Chris was doing, given his autism. By the time Chris was in high school, he had a very strong urge to find love. Chris wanted nothing more than to have a girlfriend of his very own. There was a group of girls in his high school that kind of protected him, and they were nice to him. He deemed them as gal pals. This is a term that would stick through the rest of Chris's life. On November 13th, 1996, Chris was daydreaming about a Sonic character by the name of Mighty the Armadillo when out of nowhere, a basketball hit him in the face. This inspired him to create Bionic the Hedgehog. Not because the character was robotic in any way, but because he plays basketball and is orange. Therefore, Basketball Sonic is Bionic. When Chris was in high school, he was given an assignment that couldn't have the use of copyrighted characters in it. This inspired him to mash Sonic and Pikachu together and create a new character known as Sonichu. Sonichu ended up becoming Chris's mascot after a while. He even created a medallion out of model magic that he wore all the time. In the year 2000, Chris created something that would change his life forever. Sonichu Issue Zero, a webcomic featuring the titular Sonichu and his father, Christian Weston Chandler. Through college, Chris continued to long after a girlfriend over all else. This led him to hatch a plan. Chris created what he called an attraction sign. This attraction sign displayed Chris's age, race, pros, and cons about him. And most importantly, the fact that he was searching for a cute 18 to 20 year old single female companion, 18 to 21 years of age, who does not have a boyfriend already, average to slender weight, white, lives in Charlottesville or Rockersville, does not smoke, drink alcohol, and positive personality. It also states that if any men read the signs to mind their own business, and for all men with girlfriends, except married people and blacks, to go jump off a cliff. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine why this didn't work? Chris had a big thing about men having girlfriends, since every time Chris tried to flirt with a girl, they would tell them that she already had a boyfriend, so this led to Chris to only want boyfriend-free girls. Around this time, Chris himself ended up becoming the main character of Sonichu, and most of the stories just revolved around things that happened in Chris's life. The dean of Chris's college, Mary Lee Walsh, kept confiscating Chris's attraction signs and telling him that they wouldn't work and that they seemed to be solicitation. This angered Chris to a large extent, to the point where he added Mary Lee Walsh as a villain in Sonichu. All of Sonichu took place in a town known as Quickville. Quick being CWC, as in Christian Weston Chandler. Chris got very, very involved in this fictional town, but more on that later. So how do people even know about Chris Chan, you might be wondering. How come so much of this information is public? Well, Chris Chan didn't become the most documented person in human history just by chance. One of the first times Chris was mentioned online was by a woman who worked at Chris's local mall. She essentially wrote a blog post talking about how awkward Chris was and how strange he was to her. In 2007, Chris Chan made a YouTube channel by the name of Sonichu. The seemingly normal thing probably didn't seem to be such a big deal for Chris at the time, but he was very, very wrong about that. At this point, Christian was a frequent visitor of an establishment by the name of the Game Place. At the Game Place, he made a friend, an actual friend. Her name was Megan Schroeder. Megan and Chris actually had some stuff in common, and they got along well. This was new for Chris, obviously. At this point, Sony was running a contest for the game Parappa the Rappa, by the name of Chop Chop Master Onion Showdown. 
For this challenge, you had to make a video singing to a song from the game, and you'd win a free vacation and two PlayStation Portables. Chris wanted to win this so he could take Megan on the trip and give her the PSP so she could fall in love with him despite her not sharing the feelings that he had for her. Long story short, Chris Chan lost to a man named Adam Stackhouse, who he would grow to hate. On October 26, 2007, photos of Chris at the game place were posted to 4chan, and later, talk about Chris spread to the Something Awful forums from earlier in the iceberg. A website known as The Quickie started as a way to chronicle Chris Chan information since lots of people on the internet started to become fascinated with his life. In an attempt to mess with him, they started spreading fake information about his character. This infuriated Chris so much. He had thought of a way to counter it, though. A way that is very confusing to most, but made sense to him. Chris decided that he would do something called an information overload, which essentially was Chris posting a shit ton of true information about himself in an attempt to override all the fake information. The problem is Chris used a lot of embarrassing information for some reason and posted some explicit drawings as well. There's one specifically of Chris performing a sexual act on an unknown woman. This woman ended up being Megan. Yeah, this poor, poor girl. She figured out about it and got very mad at Chris for this. He claimed that he made it because he had to channel that energy somewhere and he didn't want to come out and he do something stupid to her. What he meant by that is still unknown, but the implications are really sinister. Needless to say, Megan was disgusted and broke it off with Chris permanently. After this, Chris Chan continued to pick up more attention online, the vast majority of which being negative attention. People began to troll Chris Chan in many different ways. At first it was kind of simple, but increasingly became more and more brutal. A group of these said trolls created a fictional woman that was essentially a character that they all played in an attempt to get Chris to fall in love with her. This character was named Blanco Weiss, a joke about Chris's racism towards any woman that weren't white. To make it short, the trolls used Blanca to get naked pictures of Chris and access his online accounts and passwords and stuff like that. Chris and Blanca broke it off, and he continued to talk with other catfishes, and often these fictional women were killed off by the trolls whenever it got stale to Chris. Chris would often add these fake women to his comic book as characters. This further involved the trolls in the history of Chris Chan. A very cruel and unfortunate thing happened between Chris and Blanca. After Blanca convinced Chris to send her this iconic and beloved Sanju medallion that Chris wore all the time, a troll sent back a video of him destroying the medallion in a bunch of really cruel ways. This, in my opinion, was one of the first times the trolls just took it way too far. Not that the rest of it was okay, but this just really pushed it, and unfortunately this was not the last of the brutality. A bunch of other trolling attempts happened, like one where someone pretended to be Shigeru Miyamoto who wanted to make a Sonichu game for Nintendo. Obviously this wasn't true, but Chris bought it. Eventually, one of the most iconic trolls reared his classic head. <sighs> Captain's Log, start date, June 21st, 2009. <sighs> My name is Christian Weston Chandler. A guy who made videos doing a really good Christian impression ended up being found by trolls and sent to Chris. Chris believed that the man was actually an imposter trying to steal his identity and Sonichu. The imposter who's known as Liquid Chris as a reference to the Metal Gear Solid games played into this and started messing with Chris himself. This led to some really, really entertaining things between the two of them. Chris genuinely believed that Liquid was trying to steal his characters and profit from them. Chris decided a way to settle this and find out who was and wasn't the real Christian Weston Chandler. Chris decided they would do something known as the Sing Star Challenge, which is pretty much a karaoke challenge. Chris Chan wrote a song parody by the name of So Want a Cute Girl, which is a parody of I Want It That Way, which is as sad as it sounds. Liquid covered it beautifully on an actual guitar. The main thing about Liquid Chris is that he was really everything Chris Chan had ever wanted to be. He was successful, attractive, talented, had a girlfriend, and was respected. And was just generally a better Chris Chan. Do you get it yet? Do you? This is a very, very long story, and this isn't even halfway done, but for the sake of the video I'll just relay some more relevant information. In 2014, Chris Chan transitioned from male to female. I'll be referring to Chris with female pronouns from now on. People debate whether or not Chris Chan is really a part of the trans community, but it's really not my place to comment on that. Since 2014, she had been convinced that all of her characters in Quickville were all real and indeed existed in another universe that could be accessed. Chris Chan became delusional and genuinely believed that every character ever conceived was a part of this dimension. In 2021, Chris Chan was on a call with a woman, and she essentially prompted Chris to talk about, well, what she'd been doing recently. 
and it turns out that Chris had been doing really, really unspeakable things to her mother, Barbara. This ended in Chris Chan being arrested, and prison's the only place she'll be for the foreseeable future. The story ended in absolute tragedy. It completely destroys any pity I once had for Chris, and the entire situation is completely sickening. What's crazy is the reason the Chris Chan story is so interesting to me is because I actually walked right by her at a convention in 2017. Damn right. I went to BronyCon as a 12 year old and was at the same panel that this video was taken from. I would known very little about Chris Chan outside of the general concept of Sonichu, so I didn't know about Chris's transition, which made me think that this person was just someone wearing a medallion as a joke. After Chris spoke on the panel, I stood up to ask a question, and Chris and I walked down the same aisle opposite to each other. After this moment, I was hooked and learned all about Chris with a few documentaries on YouTube. Since then, I've been completely fascinated with the story and have been keeping up with everything since. If you want a full Chris Chan lore documentary video from me, let me know, and honestly, I think it would make a pretty good video. Alright, if you're still watching, let's move on to the next layer of the iceberg. Cold Waters Pre-WW.social media this entry is referring to the idea that there could be a primitive form of social media before www. which is the format that's used by almost every website on the surface web. World Wide Web was made public domain in 1993, so it's very unlikely that social media platforms existed, but what if there was something that even barely resembled the modern social media platforms of today? These long lost websites would have had really small user bases since not many people were using the internet back before 1993. The contents of these hypothetical websites could either be innocent, or charming, or potentially terrifying and disturbing. What could be on a website like this so long ago? Well, we may never know. TikTok Animal Rescue Animal Abuse Rings Just want to give a trigger warning for some animal abuse topics. I'm not going to show anything, but the things this entry are referring to are really disturbing. On TikTok and YouTube, there are channels that claim to show the people who own the account saving animals who are in dangerous and deadly situations. These videos do really well since people are interested in seeing cute animals be rescued from terrible situations. Thing is, the people behind these videos are the ones putting the animals in this danger. The reason this is labeled as an abuse ring is because there will be multiple channels run by the same person, putting the same animals in danger and profiting off of it. It's truly evil and sickening and I hope that everyone involved in making those videos goes to hell. If you see a channel like this, report it. TikTok is responsible for OnlyFans success. So I'm sure you've all heard of OnlyFans in the past, right? Well, that platform really blew up, and so quickly. But why? Well, some think that TikTok's responsible, and here's why. People on TikTok will often use the platform to promote their OnlyFans. It's pretty easy to get tons of views on TikTok, so it makes promoting OnlyFans way easier than by other means. People will post videos of themselves that are kind of more safe for work previews of their work on OnlyFans, let's just say. And there are many lonely men out there, so... There you go. Facebook Security Breach 2021 This entry is exactly what it sounds like. In 2021, hackers stole 533 million Facebook users' phone numbers and personal data, full names, locations, email addresses, and biographical information. The hackers who stole this information could use all of it to impersonate people and commit fraud. This wasn't even the first time that this happened with Facebook. People trust Facebook, and they should never have something like this happen to them. It's scary. 4chan got a terrorist base bombed. Yeah, they, they did. In 2016, Syrian terrorists had posted videos of their training on YouTube. These were found by people on 4chan who used Google Earth to find out where they were and where their base was. An Anon had contact with Russian military personnel and shared all the coordinates and got the base airstriked. This isn't the first time that 4chan users have found the locations of people, but as far as I know, it's the first time that they've got them bombed. Slenderman Stabbings on May 31st, 2014, an awful tragedy struck when a young girl was stabbed multiple times by her closest friend. But why? Morgan Geyser and Peyton Lutner were best friends. Peyton saw Morgan sitting alone at lunch one day and decided to sit next to her, and the rest was history. They became really close over the years and had a really sweet friendship. Morgan then became friends with Anissa Wire, and they became fans of Creepypasta. This was back when creepypastas were at their prime, so the community around them was still really active. Morgan and Anissa ended up believing that if they killed a person, they could become proxies for Slenderman, and thought that by being these servants to Slenderman, they believed that he would take them to the Slender Mansion, which was a place where all the creepypasta characters lived. The girls believed it all. It came to the point where the girls planned to kill Peyton so Slenderman would accept them. Unfortunately, after a birthday party and sleepover, the girls decided to put their plan into action and meet Slenderman. 
They lured Peyton out into the woods and tried to get her to lay in dirt and cover herself in dirt and sticks. Peyton could tell that something was wrong, so she didn't go along with their requests. Unfortunately, they decided it was time to go out with their plan. Peyton was stabbed by Morgan multiple times while Anissa watched. Eventually, the girls ran off, thinking that Peyton had passed away. Luckily, Peyton survived and mustered up the strength to move herself to a place where she could be found. She was found and rescued by a biker who called an ambulance and got her to safety. Morgan and Anissa were arrested and tried as adults. They were both found not guilty by means of mental disease and were both put in mental hospitals. Turns out, Morgan is schizophrenic has been taking medication since, which helps explain why she truly believed that Slender Man was real. She would see him in dreams and just generally in her life. As for Anissa, she was in the mental institution for seven years and she was released early and will be under supervision until the age of 37. This story is such an incredibly tragic and bizarre one, and the fact that any of this happened at all is incredibly unfortunate and saddening. The fact that Peyton is alive and going strong is truly inspiring and good. There's something haunting about this story. Since back when this all happened, I was also a little kid at a similar age, being obsessed with creepypasta and all the characters involved with it, so it all really hits close to home. The Slenderman Stabbings is now one of the most famous internet-related crimes out there, and serves as a chilling tale for parents and what their children view online. Russia using social media for misinformation. The entry name says it all. In recent years, and especially through 2022, Russia has been using social media to try and influence the opinions of the West. Russia has been using social media to try and influence the opinions of people in the West, and has really picked up since the invasion of Ukraine. Accounts on social media have been trying to influence the narrative on Russia's actions in an attempt to them, in an attempt for them to be looked at more favorably. They've been using TikTok influencers to try and make the invasion look like a good thing, and it turns out most of the influencers doing this are reading off of a very similar script to one another, which is scary. My message to everyone watching this video is to stay vigilant. Don't listen to everything you hear on social media and try to cross-check things you hear, especially if it's something you'll be deriving a strong opinion on. Only you can help stop the spread of information. Think for yourself. If something seems incorrect, dig a little deeper because you might be being lied to. Coco Melon harms mental development. Coco Melon is the number one largest children's YouTube channel out there. Most people born in the 2000s probably aren't aware of this channel's size, but those with baby siblings and modern parents certainly know the length of this channel, and unfortunately, the mental effects on the children who view their content. Coco Melon is not good for children, in multiple ways. Generally, children's content can be a little mindless. You look at Gen Z's early childhood shows like Teletubbies and Booba, and it might seem pretty strange and mindless, but those were different. Coco Melon's content is made specifically to effectively suck all the kids' attention and make them hooked. The way the videos are shot, the amount of cuts and camera movement in the videos, and bright colors, and earworm songs all work to make a kid obsessed with Coco Melon's content. This might sound crazy, but it's true. Children are actually becoming addicted to this content, which is very good for Coco Melon, since the sound of their intro alone makes these kids act like sleeper agents. Part of what makes these videos so captivating and overstimulating is actually the way that they're cut and the length of the shots. Yeah, it may sound strange, but it's true. A YouTuber named Savantix made a video comparing the shot length of Cocomelon compared to other animated content. The longest shot in the majority of Cocomelon videos was only around 6 seconds long, compared to the other shows including a high energy action show known as Arcane, which had longer shots than Cocomelon despite it being a high energy action show and having a completely different genre and demographic, being older kids and teenagers. If you want to learn more about this comparison, I'd highly recommend Savantic's video. Cocomelon has essentially ruined a lot of toddlers' attention spans, since after watching tons of Cocomelon, everything else seems slow and uninteresting to these poor kids, since normal children's content isn't designed to be this overstimulating. If anyone watching this is a parent, older sibling, nanny, older cousin, anything, please don't let the kids around you watch this. Show them some actual TV programming made for kids. Hell, just let them watch some Steve or Joe era Blues Clues, put on some Sesame Street, anything. We don't know what the effects of this content will be on the minds of these children in the future, but it really isn't looking good. This is our next generation, the people who will be leading the world in the future. So just think about that for a second. TikTok is a Chinese cyber weapon. This isn't even a theory or some out there conspiracy, it's just true. TikTok is essentially spyware the Chinese government is using to collect as much data as possible from every single one of its users. Don't believe me? Well, did you know that TikTok collects every single bit of data that it can from you? 
The fact is, by having TikTok on your phone, you are consensually letting them access all of your photos, keystrokes, search history, text conversation history, your phone's hardware details, information on the other apps that you use, your location at all times, and many, many more terrifying details. TikTok's inherent design has been found to be psychologically damaging to those who use it. It lowers the attention span of its users and uses really clever psychological tricks to get them all hooked. TikTok uses similar strategies to casinos and how they get people to stay on the app for hours and hours, just swiping, doing the same motion there for hours, being fed a constant loop of dopamine-filled brainless content. TikTok is required to send all of its data directly to the CCP. All of it. If that's not scary to you, then it should be. The Chinese government is not good, and it doesn't like America all that much. Having so much data is an incredibly bad thing, so much to the point where the US Army forbids soldiers and officers and any military personnel from having TikTok installed on their phones because of the security threat. This is so bad that the Indian government pulled a full-on ban on TikTok because it, quote, posed a threat to the sovereignty and integrity of India. Yeah, if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. TikTok is not some innocent social media platform for teenagers. It's a cyber weapon. TikTok is terrifying, and I hope that hearing the information in this video will at least help some people realize the reality of this app. Hillary Clinton Email Scandal Back in 2016, one of the main things going against presidential candidate Hillary Clinton was a scandal regarding tons of emails that she had deleted. She wiped thousands of emails clean, and I don't really want to get political here, but this was definitely not a good look for Clinton, and she was justifiably criticized for it. But yeah, maybe she was hiding something, maybe she wasn't, but the Clintons aren't exactly the most trustworthy. Where deleted content goes? A question I'm sure we've all asked before is where does deleted content go? Well, the answer is actually pretty interesting. So I imagine we all hope deleted content just goes away. You know, it's deleted forever. Well, that's not exactly the case. When it comes to stuff that you delete off your computer, it's still recoverable, even when you empty your trash can. So can your files be truly deleted? Well, yes, eventually. You see, when you delete a file, you don't actually delete it. Instead, it basically just tells your hard drive that the space that it used to take up can now be overwritten by something new. So basically, until something new takes the space of it, the original file can still be recovered. Pretty interesting and a weird thing to have in the back of your mind. Metaverse will end freedom. The metaverse could be the end of our freedom. If our second reality becomes what it sets out to be and truly succeeds and takes over our work, shopping, concerts, events, social lives, and online presence, it could truly end freedom as we know it. Having one power-hungry man like Mark Zuckerberg control over the entire platform is a terrifying thought. Essentially, freedom is only as free as one's technological overlords allow it to be. There are people getting married in the metaverse, and businesses are starting to heavily incorporate into their workplace. The metaverse, like all Facebook products, will gather every single bit of information that it can. Through Oculus, Facebook already has access to everything you do on there. Every game you play, how long you play the game for, your surroundings. Hell, the Oculus is always online as long as it's plugged in. The thing is constantly reporting back to Facebook, which is pretty scary alone. I personally do not want to join the metaverse, even if it really becomes a thing. I refuse to buy a pair of NFT shoes. I refuse to replace real social interaction with some boo-boo ass VR interaction. You'll find me dead before I find love in the metaverse. Facebook really is an evil company. I know it's kind of hard to escape. I mean, I myself have an Instagram and an Oculus, so I guess I'm kind of part of the problem. But to me, it's still worth it to speak out about Facebook. Praise thought. If the metaverse truly takes over like Mark wants, it could end freedom as we know it. Alright everyone, that wraps it up for the social media iceberg, fully explained. Got a little darker there at the end, the second part got on the creepier side, and that's how we like it here, kind of returning to that form of content because that's what I feel works best on this channel. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know because it was a labor of love. Uh, if you didn't know about Chris Chan before this, I sincerely apologize. You know, you could have lived your whole life without all that information. And for those who are interested, I may have just started a whole ass rabbit hole for you guys because there's a lot of Chris Chan stuff out there. But yeah, this was a pretty fun video to make. Lots of creative concepts and fun stuff. I'm kind of curious as to what you guys want the future of this channel to be. Like, does it, do you guys want it to be creepy? Like, going forward? Or more on the lighter side with the nostalgia stuff and then the first half of this social media iceberg? I don't know, because I, I genuinely, I like the creepier side of things, I think that's the most fun. 
but I want to know what you guys think. I'm officially back. <laughs> Took a bit of a hiatus there. Not, not an official one, but I just kind of ignored my channel for a little while there, but not anymore. I am back. So expect a lot more content from me. Also, what do you guys think of this, uh, my, my door here? It's a lot cooler now. It used to just be like an old paint, uh, an old, like, big paper drawing. Now we've got a bunch of stuff. I want to see anyone in the comments who, uh, can recognize everything that you see here. I will rip my heart out and put it right on your comment. Because there's a lot of obscure kind of nine, like, 2000s y stuff on here. So I'll be surprised if someone can name everything. There's Jar Jar Binks. That's a freebie right there. This is the kind of video where I want to hear a lot of feedback for it. So if you've got something to say about it, if you enjoyed it, if you hated it, please let me know because, uh, yeah, I want to know. It genuinely, all, all the feedback is really important to me. And also it's great for the comments section because it boosts the algorithm. So more importantly, I want to know what you're thinking, but it also helps. If you've got any requests for me to do any certain type of videos that you're interested in, please let me know because I would love to hear them. Honestly, might do something. Hell, even if you are another YouTuber and you want to collaborate, I'm always open. I'm always down. So let me know. Just want to give a big thank you to everyone watching this for watching this because I appreciate you. If you made it all the way down here to the end of this video, good job. Thank you. But yeah, I think that's it for me for now, right? So I've been your favorite Emo Flynn writer or Latin <laughs> Roderick Hefley signing out. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you all for watching very much.